Hello, and welcome back to Engage with Eagle Forum. I'm one of your hosts, Kirsten Hassler, Eagle Forum's Executive Director. And I'm Tabitha Walter, our Political Director. Today, we are breaking down school choice. This is an issue we think should be a part of a national conversation since 90% of American children attend public school. Politicians have thrown out the pros and the cons, but we wanted to have a real conversation about it without all of the partisan politics. And we've invited Inez Stepman on the show to break it down for us. Inez is a senior policy analyst at the Independent Women's Forum, and her research focuses on educational freedom, school choice, and the cultural impact of empowering parents with control over their children's education. She's also a Lincoln Fellow with the Claremont Institute and a contributor to The Federalist. Thank you so much for joining us, Inez. It's great to have you on. It's wonderful to be here with both of you. And as your research focus includes parental empowerment in their child schooling, so you've spent a lot of time studying school choice. Now, what exactly is school choice and what are the different models or ideas? Um, well, school choice is kind of a broad umbrella term, uh, but it can encompass all kinds of, of schools that are simply not the assigned or education, actually, environments that are not the assigned local um, brick and mortar public school, right? So um, what a lot of people think about when they think about school choice might be charter schools, which are public schools. Um, and there, there's no tuition at the door, so they're, they're um, fully funded public schools. Uh, but the running and operation of the charter schools um, is not done by the district. So it's either done by a private company and that can be for profit or in some uh, in some states or nonprofit. So and then they're also released from a lot of the the sort of red tape and the regulations um, that traditional public schools have uh, have to deal with. So uh, that's one thing a lot of people think about, but it's a lot broader than that. Um, there's private school choice, which are um, programs that allow parents to take uh, state dollars that are, are sort of assigned. Every kid has a, a, um, a dollar amount assigned uh, to his or her education um, by the state. So that allows parents to take some of, some portion of that money. It's never 100%, but um, anywhere from sometimes a third to a half to 75% of that money. Um, and then to use it either at a private school of their choice uh, for tuition, that would be a straight up voucher, which is um, sort of the old version of school choice. And then the newer version is, um, you know, a voucher is sort of inflexible, right? Because it, it goes straight to the private school in sort of a lump sum um, and parents can't uh, pick and choose, let, let's say I wanna use part of that funds, um, those funds to hire a tutor, for example, or, or um, very relevantly for our, our moment. Um, maybe I wanna form a pod with, with some other families and I want to hire a tutor or a teacher. Um, you can't really use a voucher for that. So uh, the, the newest kid on the block in, in school choice um, is actually educational choice, uh, which is education savings accounts. So that money just goes into an account for the family and they can use it for literally anything. They can use it for curricula at home. They can use it for tutoring. They can use it to hire uh, teachers. They can use it um, to, uh, to hire therapists for any special needs their child might, might have. So um, there are all kinds of uses. As long as it's an educational use, you can use that account for that. Um, so parents are using those accounts for some amazing things, including like flying lessons, for example. There's there's one micro school in Florida that focuses on academics and um, you graduate not just with a high school degree, but with a pilot's license. Um, so there, there's parents are doing all kinds of creative things with those, with those programs. Wow, now at the beginning you had talked about the money following the child as one of the models. And then you mentioned that it wasn't the full 100% of the, of the funding. Why is that? Well, I mean, the primary reason is because teachers unions oppose these programs and they're a process of political negotiation in the states. Um, but also it's difficult because there are so many different funding streams. And actually, I'm glad you, you brought up school funding because I think there is a, a um, myth that's really in operation throughout much of the American political spectrum. And I've heard this from Democrats and I've heard this from Republicans. Uh, and that, that is the public schools are underfunded in America when in reality, we are one of the world's top per pupil spenders, um, depending on how you measure things. We're usually in the, the second to fourth place range in terms of how much money we spend per student. It's well over $700 billion a year that we spend on K-12 wow. education. And the average per pupil amount is, is um, around $15,000 a year. So if you ask a lot of people, um, I mean, a third of people in a survey thought that we spend less than $5,000 uh, a year per child. That's a third of the average, right? So um, there's a lot of people under the impression because they're constantly hearing 
that the problem with our schools is that we don't invest enough in them. That's just not true. We've increased funding um, for decade after decade, and we have some of the highest funding levels in the world, um, and, and yet we haven't seen achievement go up correspondingly. So uh, the, the problems are elsewhere. They're not in funding. So I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up because it gave me a chance to, to sort of debunk that myth that I think is very pervasive well across the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. And are school choice laws at the state level or at the, are they at the federal level? And then do all states have these laws in their books? So uh, most school choice programs are state level programs. So uh, fortunately in the U.S., um, one of the aspects of federalism and the federalist system that we have is that education is still, even today, um, when the federal government has intervened well beyond its constitutional mandate, but even so, uh, education is still overwhelmingly a state and local issue, um, and about 90 percent of the funding also comes from the state and local uh, governments. So the feds, all of the fuss over the federal government is about 10 percent of the funding. 90% of is coming from state and local. So um, because of that, most of the time you're talking about a, a state school choice program. Uh, there are instances where the feds can implement school choice. So for example, um, in Washington, D.C., right, which is a, a federal district, uh, there, there is uh, the D.C. Opportunity Scholarship Program, which is a voucher program um, that, that has become, a, unfortunately, a political um, club between mm -hmm. the two parties reauthorizing the program. Um, but that is a federal school choice program because um, the district is, is ultimately federal. Uh, and then there's been some proposals for other federal school choice programs. So for example, uh, to allow the kids of military families who move around a ton, right, um, to, to uh, take some of their, um, the additional funding that's given to school districts to who enroll military family children, um, to allow the families more control over those dollars so that uh, they might for example, prefer to, to um, use a program where they don't have so much transition um, and, and so much uh, sort of disruption when they do move place to place. Uh, so there, there's, those are some of the federal programs that have been proposed. Now, there has been a federal tax credit proposed, um, which would be a true national school choice program. I'm a little wary of national school choice programs, mostly because I'm wary that, you know, in future administrations, regulations will be attached that uh, end up harming private schools' autonomy um, and, and their ability to, uh, to teach, for example, um, what they believe about various cultural hot-button topics uh, to students. So um, I'm a little wary of, of huge national school choice programs, but they have been proposed. That's so interesting. Um, so as a follow-up here, let's talk a little bit about some of the benefits of school choice. So obviously, it empowers parents to make the best decision for their children, but it touches on more than that. Um, you highlighted a few statistics from a 2016 University of Arkansas study in an article entitled The Situation School Choice in 2019. In this article, you cite that students in the voucher program in Milwaukee were a full 79% less likely to be convicted of a felony than their matched public school peers. And then further, there was also a drop of 93% and 87% for drug crime and theft convictions. So how is school choice doing this? So uh, first, that study has actually already been replicated um, once again, and they found similar drops in crime um, in that Milwaukee program, and actually a third decline in um, participation in fraternity suits, right, which means that either the students from the program, as they go on to become young adults, are less likely to have a child out of wedlock, or at least they're less likely to dispute paternity and, and take uh, take responsibility for uh, the children that they've, they've fathered. So um, I, I tend to focus on these kinds of results because I think they're so much more important than standardized test scores. Um, these are the kind of results that actually transform communities and neighborhoods and families uh, that allow people who are born in challenging circumstances to escape those circumstances and rejoin sort of the mainstream um, American life and, and to have all of the opportunities that come with that. And, and I think in answer to your question about why school choice is able to provide those opportunities, I think um, it comes down to school culture, right? So a lot of times education researchers like me or my colleagues, um, tend to focus on those test scores because they give us some kind of picture over large groups of people, right? So you can't ask every student in a school um, how, how they feel about the school. You can't interview, you know, 700 families um, in, in a time effective way. So you look at test scores. But the reality is that it's, it's almost more important 
what kind of example um, is being set for kids, whether uh, they're learning the discipline that they need to then go out into the workforce, whether they're learning um, you know, to, to become productive citizens uh, of, of this country and, and who are able to pursue their dreams um, in, in this fantastic country. So I, I think that oftentimes these uh, private schools have a totally different cultural environment than the kids leave behind at the public schools. And so they're exposed to um, more, uh, oftentimes, uh, sort of more regimented discipline practices. They're exposed to oftentimes um, a lot of the, the neighborhoods for, for kids, because most of these programs are aimed at extremely low income kids, right? You have to have uh, an income right around the poverty line or maybe a multiple of the poverty line in order to enroll in the program. So a lot of times in neighborhoods, for example, fatherhood has basically like disappeared, right? Not just that there's a high level of, um, birth out of wedlock but that that virtually all the households are matriarchal and headed only by mothers um and a lot of these kids the first time they have uh, any any opportunity to see um for example married intact families is is in a different environment in in this school so i i don't i can't give you like an exact reason we only know that the correlation and the the causation exists um mm -hmm for these kinds of drops in crime and, and drops in paternity suits. But I, I really wish that actually there was more focus on studying these kinds of outcomes because ultimately we know in America that if you're able to complete the success sequence, right, which is graduate from high school, not have children um, out of wedlock, um, get married and get a job, any job, doesn't matter what how, how um, sort of entry level the job is, but if you complete those four things, your chances of being in poverty um, are, are in the, the low single digits, right? So um, a lot of times these, these schools are exactly providing the opportunity to kids to um, observe that success sequence and then to, to follow it themselves. So I think that's a really important part of school choice. Yeah, I, I completely agree and I think um, people learn different ways and we have we we all have different families we have different situations and when you have school choice at your fingertips you can place your child in an environment that's going to best suit them rather than a one-size-fits-all equation and so you you make a really good point there and and we know that when the federal government has a say in these situations there are always issues. Um, it's not perfect. And a, a lot of times it leads to more issues than we started with. Um, now, we at Eagle Forum are a bit wary of school choice for this very reason. Um, I think when, when legislators come together to create this, uh, these policies, they always want their hand in it and they want, always want strings attached. And so how do we ensure when, when these policies are created, whether it's federally or state and local, how do we ensure that there's no fraud or abuse of tax dollars, while also ensuring protections for religious schools that have certain policies that we don't want the government to interfere? And then when federal dollars get tied to the child through school choice, um, how do we reconcile these principles of accountability and autonomy? Uh, that's a really good question, and it, it's not that I dismiss the um, the possibility that participating in these programs might erode the character or the independence of these schools. Um, in fact, that's why um, I've always, when when I used to do more legislative work, um, a lot of it was making sure that this kind of stuff did not end up in in bills and encouraging legislatures um, to to think about the consequences of, of putting sometimes innocuous sounding regulation that then erodes the, the real choice, right? Um, what we don't want is school choice in name, but uh, a, a landscape where all the schools are teaching the same thing in essentially the same way, that that's not the point, right? Um, as you said, kids are different, uh, families are different, they have different values. We need to preserve the ability um, of, of schools to actually um, create a culture and an environment that respects those values. So. Um, I think that's all enormously important to me, uh, and, and here I'll speak as a conservative and not just as an education researcher. Um, I, I absolutely think the risks are worth it because I think if you, um, 
as you said in the beginning, 90% of kids go through public school. And right now we know what kids are learning um, in public schools with regard to, for example, citizenship, with regard to what they think about America and American history, um, with regard to human sexuality, all of these kind of cultural topics that then go on to be flashpoints between the left and the right. Um, I think a lot of us on the right feel that the culture is racing to the left constantly. And a huge part of that is that 90% of kids go through the same public schools where they learn these things. Um, and, and if you think the 90% are going to leave you alone and your schools, your private schools alone, um, when you're quote unquote, what, what they would define as teaching bigotry, right? It's, it's not going to matter whether it's a school choice program or not. They're going to come after the, the curriculum in the private schools, um, I think in the coming years, one way or another. And we just have to be prepared to fight those fights. Um, one uh, really important fight with school choice programs is actually has been so-called SOGI laws, right? Um, so school choice programs are usually exempt from all but basic civil rights legislation. Uh, so they, if you're a school, you can't discriminate on the basis of race, for example. Okay, like that makes sense. Um, but of course, some states are now adding SOGI laws, right? Um, which is, is uh, a based around gender identity, right? Like you have to accommodate boys who say they're girls who want to use the girls restroom or the girls locker room and private schools have policies on their books that say that they don't do that um, and we've seen some of these clashes where schools have been dropped from programs for example in in maryland um, because they stuck to uh their their uh, christian beliefs there's there was a christian academy that was dropped in maryland um so i, I think a lot of this honestly is going to come one way or another. I don't think school choice are a main driver really of those kinds of attacks on, on private schools autonomy. I think those attacks are coming regardless. And then I, I would also put in a pitch for education savings accounts because all of the research that we've done shows that education savings accounts have uh, the lowest amount of regulations. And, th and that makes sense, right? Because the uses of the money are so much more flexible that it's, it's no longer really about the schools accepting the vouchers. Um, it's very, very clear that the families are making a whole bunch of individual decisions um, and, and it's, it's harder than to like ideologically regulate what decisions families are making. Um, so I think those are generally sort of safer programs to enact. I, d I don't think there's any complete safety, but I think that school choice is probably um, at least among the top, I think it's the most important thing, but at least among the top three most important things that we need to do in order to win some of these cultural battles because we're going to keep losing as long as 90% of kids are going through the same indoctrination in private school and uh, sorry, in public schools. Right. No, so, we, we totally agree with that. <laughs> I was just going to say kind of along those lines, there has been a really long history in our country of federal intervention, like with uh, no child left behind or common core. So, and those have all largely failed. Can you talk a little bit about why those programs don't work? Yeah, I mean, I think to tell this story, you really have to go back to the Great Society in the 1960s, right? So late 1960s, you have LBJ as president, he launches the Great Society. Um, and, and one of the, the problems that he, he identifies, um, which, which is legitimately a real problem at the time, he says, look, there are a lot of school districts that are really poor in this country. Um, and the, the local taxation structure doesn't support um, a basic level of, of money for the schools. So the federal government is going to shore up um, how much money is spent in those schools, right? So that was the original purpose of the, the first federal, there, there were some minor things before that, but all related to national security, right? So like, um, you know, STEM and, you know, mathematics teaching during the Cold War, to, you know, once Sputnik was launched, right? Um, mm -hmm. And the United States was winning the, the, or losing the space race. So uh, there were some minor federal interventions before that, but this was the first major big block of money that went to um, states schools, right? So uh, prior to that, states had been virtually completely in charge of both the autonomy of their school districts and the funding. Um, so, and, and that kind of seems like a reasonable argument, right? There, there legitimately were really poor school districts that were not able to provide an adequate education at all um, to the people who went to them, the kids who went to them. Um, so why shouldn't the feds spend a little money um, and try to make things a little more equal? You know, I can think of ideological reasons to oppose that, uh, but it sounds like a reasonable argument. But once that happened, um, all of the federal interventions that people really didn't like sort of became not inevitable, but but that first pot of money definitely strongly 
um, led to some of these other consequences. So of course, in, in the federal government, nothing ever shrinks, it only grows. So over the, the next decade or so, that pot of money kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, which then, um, by the time you get to the late 70s, people are saying, well, we're spending all of this money and we have no idea where it's going. We're not keeping track of it. I mean, it seems like the responsible thing to do to actually know, um, you know, to categorize all of these different programs to see where the dollars are going. Okay, so they, 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 that's when the Department of Education was created, right? Because no longer was it just a, a couple little offices collecting education statistics, right? Um, they were going to do the much bigger project of actually tracking where all of these billions of dollars, right, um, were going. And, and so that's when they started the Department of Education. We know Reagan famously failed to kill the department um, even a couple years later. And like everything in, in the federal government, as I said, it kept growing. So now you have a Department of Education that's tracking where all of these dollars are going. And by then you get to the Bush administration, W. Bush, um, and, and there's all these billions of dollars. We're tracking all these programs. And what we're finding is it's not really working. Like we don't see any return on investment. We're not seeing um, sort of scores on, on NAEP, which is sort of the national assessment. We're not seeing scores go up. So we want to know whether these dollars are actually helping, right? Um, and that's what led to the passage of No Child Left Behind. Um, so No Child Left Behind put in place carrots and the sticks, right? You'll get more money if you do well and you improve um, your students' test scores and you'll get less money um, if, if you fail to make that adequate progress with your students' test scores. Okay, so it was, it was an attempt to try to like incentivize success through federal money. Again, this sounds sort of reasonable if you think about all the billions of dollars that were going out and we weren't keeping track of whether they were working or not, but it had, again, all of these unintended consequences because the states were still in charge of the assessment programs, right? The state testing was still in the hands of the states. So of course, if the states were gonna get more money for testing well and less money for testing poorly, um, the tests were gonna get easier. And that's, and that's what we saw, right? We saw like basically standards fall through the floor as everybody chased the highest percentage of passing um, on their own tests to get more federal money. And so that then we had a group of, of education reform people who came in and said, we want common core because we have to have some kind of national standard otherwise, right? And, and I oppose each one of these things. Um, but, but I can, you know, there, you can see there's sort of a logic to it. Once the feds got involved with education, each step made more sense. Um, and, and then finally, we saw just a huge backlash against common core, right? Um, parents did not like it. Teachers did not like it. Nobody liked common core except for, you know, some education sort of reform people and some legislators. Um, and unfortunately, what we saw was this huge backlash, very successful political movement against it that united some elements of the left and the right against it. Um, real grassroots organizing, you know, sort of civic participation, what it succeeded in doing is making the words common core toxic in political discourse, but it didn't really eliminate common core. So in a lot of states, it's just renamed, right? A lot of the standards are very similar. Um, they're just, they're named something else. Um, so unfortunately, I, would, I wouldn't call that a battle one, um, perhaps a battle half one. Uh, at, least, at least nobody is sort of openly pushing common core anymore because it's so deeply unpopular, but we haven't really succeeded in eradicating it from the states. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I do think school choice is, is a better solution than a lot of these things, because if, if we have more choice in the system, then we have more options that are not under the common core standards, that are not dealing with all of this federal intervention, that are sort of outside of the system. Um, and, and I think the more money involved in school choice, the more families have those funds, especially in ESAs, where they can split it up and, and spend it just like they would their own money, the more a market of diverse, like truly diverse educational options will, will be created in order to, to respond to parents' new purchasing power. So I think that's really the way out of this cycle is just to make it irrelevant, right? Uh, to step outside of the system um, and to encourage growth outside of the system and, and educational freedom. Um, and kind of let the, the stagnant federal intervention system sort of stay there because we're not going to get rid of it. Um, uh, so just let it kind of stay there and just have a lot less influence over kids' hearts and minds, basically. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to zero in just, just briefly on the Common Core standards. And you had said um, Common Core doesn't exist anymore, but 
it does in a way because of the standards. And I know that uh, when I talk to some conservatives, they'll say, well, standards are a conservative value. And so for our listeners, can you talk about how um, the difference between common core like standards and just typical learning standards? Sure. I, look, I don't think standards are a bad thing. Um, the, the problem is having all the standards be the same, right? It, there, there's no reason why Alabama and California have to have the same curriculum, the same standards, you know, the same testing regime. Um, you know, we, we live in a federal system, and that means that even, especially something like education should be varied between the different states. Um, so that's one huge problem with it I had, it, it, exactly that homogenizing force. So um, I think I'm just generally opposed to homogenizing education. I think it's great that there are, you know, Montessori schools that, and, and there are, um, you know, prep schools and there are uh, parochial religious schools, you know, Jewish day schools. Um, I, I, I think that that's the only way, in fact, that the 350 million Americans who have all kinds of different backgrounds, have different faiths, different worldviews, radically different political views, um, there's not a fair way to build a one-size-fits-all system with regard to standards or anything else. And then, of course, that's just the sort of political or, or um, demographic differences. I mean, anybody who has more than one kid will tell you, each kid is different. So um, it's, it's not to the student's benefit to homogenize any of this either. What we have right now is essentially a monolithic system that was built in the 19th century um, that, that is, is not really serving a lot of students well in the academic sense. I would argue that it's, it's been culturally uh, pernicious and pernicious influence as well, which is what we talked about a minute ago. Um, and, and it's simply, it's also not, it doesn't make sense in the modern world where there is so much individualization and customization in every other aspect of life, um, but somehow we're going to teach kids in the same way that we taught them, you know, in, in 19, uh, you know, 1902 in, in, uh, without changing the system in any measurable way. And I would add just one further point that I think is, is actually a negative about the system that we have it allows for so little and so diluted parent input, right? Um, people say that there are democratically controlled schools. Well, in a lot of school board elections, the turnout is around 4%. Mm -hmm. and they're often held not during major elections, so they're not aligned with the, the governor's election, for example, or a presidential election, uh, where you would have a ton of people coming out to vote and then therefore do... Um, vote for school board as well. Oftentimes they're on, you know, a Thursday in March and, and uh, people don't even know they're happening. So that's the ostensible democratic control over schools. And then once your kid is in a public school, they have absolutely no reason to listen to your concerns about whether that's about your child's individual progress, whether that's about bullying in the school, whether it's about, you know, your discomfort with some of the, the values that are being taught in the public school. Uh, they have no incentive to listen to parents about any of those things. And we've seen uh, case after case after case of schools just ignoring what parents you know, care about or what they think about what their kids are learning. And that's because ultimately if the money doesn't follow the child, it's no skin off the, you know, the principal or the district administrator's back um, if parents are unhappy because they really don't have any other options um, unless they're wealthy enough to, to pay twice, to pay taxes for public school um, and then to send their kids to a private school. So it, it um, you know, it, I, I think that that's a really, really negative aspect of our system. And I think that it would be better for everybody if we allowed parents back uh, to their, their rightful place, which I think should be in the driver's seat of their children's education. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, they're hiring schools, right? Ultimately, they're hiring educators uh, to do some of the day-to-day -day education, but they are ultimately responsible for bringing up their child. And especially in this current pandemic moment with the fights over school reopening, we're seeing how little the system actually takes into account the views of parents and how little they think of parents' um, voices mattering, right? The, the, we've seen on um, threads going viral of teachers basically saying, oh, well, you know, I hate teaching um, during the pandemic virtually because uh, parents can actually see what I'm teaching. Well, the, you, sh you shouldn't be wanting to hide what you're teaching from people's parents. Like they are responsible for their children. So I think that whole system promotes a backwards view of accountability of the relationships between parents and children and the relationships between parents and the state. Right. I, I live in Fairfax County, Virginia, and, you know, Fairfax County Schools always has a controversy at some point. But recently, 
they sent out a memo to parents saying that they are they they discouraged in-person tutors because um, even though that they they may be falling behind in classes they they want every kid to be virtually learning at the same pace and it's just it's just silly to me and it's a, it's a far overreach into parental rights um, so you you hear stories like that and and it really discourages you to almost uh, homeschool your kid and I, I think a lot of parents are going through that decision right now do I send my kid to school whether it's open or virtual or some combination of both um, or do I take the plunge into actually homeschooling and um, they when they dive into this idea there are a lot of accountability standards for homeschool families and, and they can be really crippling at times they can um, be be a discouragement to people who want to go that avenue so when we talk about school choice does that give parents another avenue to relieve those burdens for homeschool families or is that even something that's part of this debate so I definitely consider homeschooling to be part of the school choice umbrella. Um, oftentimes homeschoolers are not included in school choice programs uh, by their own request, right? So uh, there are separate legal categories for homeschooling and that's that's because a lot of homeschoolers worry, um, have some of the worries that you brought up earlier, right? They, they don't want uh, to be taking any money from the state because they worry that that money will come with strings, um, which is a legitimate worry. So they, they're in almost in every school choice bill. Um, homeschoolers are separated out as a category. So they're, they're not technically considered part of school choice programs. But the broader, the, the broader um, concept, I think absolutely are, are similar, right? It's part of educational freedom. Um, there are about 2 million uh, kids being educated at home. I, I think there will be many more come in fall. Um, I actually think we're living in a very interesting uh, time for education. I, I really do think this fall enrollment may be an earthquake. Um, in terms of the number of, of people who are withdrawing their kids from public schools that aren't reopening. Because uh, distance learning during the, the spring was a disaster for almost everybody. Um, and parents don't want to do that again. So they're either looking at pods, um, uh, and which by the way are, are sort of ESAs and pods are a match made in heaven um, because one of the major concerns with the pods uh, from the left, but also, I mean, it is a legitimate concern uh, is equity, right? That um, parents who don't have the funds to then hire a tutor or bind together with a few others and hire a tutor or a teacher, uh, their kids will fall even further behind during this time um, when they all they have access to is, is shoddy distance learning from the public school and you know wealthier kids are, are in, in, in person learning with maybe five or 10 other students. Um, legitimately, I do think that it will increase learning gaps. But of course, the solution to that isn't to, to shame parents for wanting the best for their children and trying to make sure that their children actually get an education that isn't being provided by the public schools during this time. The solution is to then pass education savings accounts so that um, every family has the means to participate in that kind of option if that's what they, they choose and that's what they think will be helpful for their kid. Um, and so, Yes, I mean, I, I, I think we'll see some very interesting things happening with homeschooling. We'll see some very interesting things happening with, with potting, which is not, I, I, you know, it could be classified as homeschooling. It could, could be classified as something called a micro school. Um, but it doesn't really matter what the classification is. The point is all of these reforms are going to put parents more in the driver's seat. They're going to restore parental guidance over education. I think that's generally always a good thing. It's always a good thing when parents have more options, uh, more ability to actually exercise those options, um, and more power to, to change course if that's not what's working for their kid, because oftentimes, you know, systems can't recognize when something is going wrong for a kid. Parents can. Alrighty, so kind of taking a little bit of a swerve now, I've seen a ton of headlines about school choice being anti-teacher union, which you did mention a little bit before um, we got into the weeds of some of this stuff. So why is it that teacher unions are opposed to school choice and how are they preventing school choice legislation and regulations from being passed? Uh, so teachers unions are still incredibly powerful lobbying forces in most state legislatures. Um, mm -hmm. And, and they are opposed to choice for very, very simple reasons, self-interest, right? Um, so if, if parents <laughs> exit the, the public school system en masse, um, it will be a massive problem for dues-paying unions. 
Um, so I, I do think that there's a huge element of self-interest and we're seeing that come out now, especially, right? We're, we're seeing demands from teachers unions for reopening that have absolutely nothing to do with coronavirus, with public health, with, I mean, there's just no logical connection whatsoever. So they're demanding that charter school moratoriums be put in place. They're demanding that private school choice programs be shut down. Um, you hear the, the rhetoric about the, the learning pods and how they're evil and bad and nobody should do them. Um, what they're really doing is closing down avenues uh, for parents to exit the system that they control, right? Um, and they also attach all kinds of political demands too, to reopening. So for example, um, the LA Teachers Union demanded that they defund the police before the schools are opened, right? So like none of this has anything to do with coronavirus. It doesn't have to do um, with public health. It doesn't have to do with um, teachers' health or safety. Uh, there are a lot of concerns. And I think if teachers unions had during this time, you know, sort of met with parents, respected their wishes, um, and then tried to come to some compromise where uh, we put in place various measures for, for teachers who have, uh, who are high risk or who are caring for their, their elderly loved ones. Or I, I think everybody understands this is a complicated and difficult time for all of us. Uh, but the demands that teachers unions have come back with on school reopenings, I think really has just laid bare that their incentives are all about their own power. Um, and this is not to say that, that, this, that every teacher is like this, right? But the unions um, definitely are, are uh, showing themselves to, to not really care about education or their students, but really to care about their own power first and to care about the adults in the system before they start to think about the students. Mm -hmm. in, in previous episodes that we've done on education, we talked about teacher unions and we told parents they don't need teacher unions to have a voice they can collectively, as a grassroots movement, have a voice on these matters and they can work with teachers, they can work with their community. And so um, they can completely take the unions out of the equation and have their own voices in this matter. So, and as, um, as we wrap, wrap up, how can parents engage on the issue of school choice? Um, well, I think they're engaging right now. They might not be calling it school choice, but um, I think we're really seeing parents stand up and just not, and just refuse to be dictated and to anymore. Um, I think a lot of parents really saw their kids suffer during the spring, uh, educationally, socially, um, and, and they're just, they're not going to accept some of these totally politicized and, um, you know, unfortunate answers from teachers unions about why schools can't reopen and they're going to look for alternatives. And I don't think the shaming is going to be particularly effective. I don't think that the pod shaming is going to be particularly effective, um, especially as I said, when there is such a, an easy answer, right? Like let's pass this choice program and then everybody will have access to the funds to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're really worried about equity and not your power, then that's the solution that you'll back. Um, but, but of course, that's not the solution that teachers unions are, are going to go for. Um, so I, I think parents are standing up. I think that um, this is a really, uh, this is going to be a time of a lot of change for the education system. And, and I think that, um, that, you know, when we, we get out on the other side of this thing, um, education life in the United States is going to look quite different. And I didn't go into this thinking that was going to be the case. I was a little bit pessimistic. Um, or about whether this would produce long-term changes in the education system. Um, I have changed my mind on that. I, I, I do think this is an earthquake. I think that we are seeing hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of families um, looking at the way that the public school system and the teachers unions have behaved through all of this um, and, and saying, nope, nope, you know, we're gonna find a better option. Um, and so I, in terms of, so that's I think what parents can do, just keep doing it, um, what you're doing. And then in terms of legislators, or uh, I, th I think that this is a really, really great time to pass education savings accounts, universal education savings accounts. Um, and and I, I think, frankly, there can be a very good public health argument being made for it. It's certainly much safer from the public health perspective to encourage families to go into um, sort of co-quarantine pods of five or 10 or 15 students than it is to, to reopen a 2,500 person high school like mine. Um, that I went to. So uh, it's, it's, I, I think it makes a lot of sense in this moment. And I think that parents will be grateful if legislators actually back them up instead of listening to teachers unions lobbying and, and starting to, to bow down to all of these totally unrelated demands that have nothing to do with the challenges that we're facing right now. Absolutely. 
And if our listeners want to take a deeper dive, how can they find your writings and your research? Sure, you can go to iwf.org. Um, we got a ton of great stuff on there. You were quoting from something called a policy focus. So we write uh, sort of longer form, but not too long, not too wonky. Um, just a few pages, two, three pages overview of different topics and policy. So we have those on charter schools, on school choice, on education savings accounts, um, on school discipline, which is also a huge issue, um, school violence and school discipline. Uh, so we have all of those, and then we have tons of, of op-eds and blog posts and Facebook Lives and podcasts, and we're, we're always um, looking for, for new ways to, to communicate with you all about, uh, about policy and about school choice in particular. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Inez. This has certainly been an informative discussion, and thank you for listening to this episode of Engage with Eagle Forum. Would you please do us a favor and consider leaving us a rating and a review? It truly does help us reach a larger audience. And for more information on school choice, please be sure to follow us on all the major social media platforms where we will post content related to the topic. Also, Eagle Forum has a new education publication, so you can visit eagleforum.org to sign up for that. Until next time, from your house to the state house to the White House, this is Engage with Eagle Forum.